Hello, my name is Paul Cornish. I'm the chief strategist at City Forum and one of the architects of the Intelligent Defence Series, together with our chairman, Mark Lee. My guest on today's podcast is General Sir Patrick Sanders. Our last podcast conversation, General, was in early 2021 when you were commanding UK Strategic Command. You're now, since June of this year, the chief of the general staff, that's to say the professional head of the British Army. Uh, First of all, welcome back and thank you very much for giving us your time, particularly when, uh, as we all know, there are, um, you might say, one or two other things going on. The title for today's podcast is the British Army in 2022 and beyond. But I, I'd like to begin, if I may, with, with something perhaps a bit more general, to ask you for your, uh, your reflections um, on the death and the lying at rest, or in state, and the funeral of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth. You, you were on parade, I've got it in, in inverted commas here, on parade as one of the, the UK uh, Armed Service Chiefs, as the professional head of the British Army, and of course, as a soldier. So it seems to me that you knew Queen Elizabeth pretty well during all of your service up, up of course, until last month. What were your, your impressions of those, of those weeks and what thoughts were you left with? So I suppose the abiding memory that I have that permeated throughout the sort of full 11 or 12 days was one of performance anxiety, particularly when it came to drill, because we had to find ourselves on parade. We also had to do the vigils uh, in Westminster Hall. And so I remember rehearsals, rehearsals very, very late at night through the streets of London. I remember trying wandering around Hyde Park, trying to practice the bizarre pace of 65 beats per minute, which is just only marginally faster than a slow march and is a very difficult pace to work at. And then I remember how difficult it was just to stay in step with the echoes of different drum beats uh, echoing around Whitehall. And then there are some genuinely sort of surreal moments. I mean, it's not often that you find yourself somewhat of my background, sitting next to His Imperial Majesty, the Emperor of Japan. The abiding sense was what an extraordinary honour it was just to have been caught in this position in that period of history. You know, as service chiefs, we buried His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh just a year and a half ago. And then standing on the catafalque in that silent echoing hall, Westminster Hall, and just feeling the weight of history on your shoulders as you stood there for our longest serving monarch, protecting her coffin. And then a sense of humility. You know, her first Chief of the General Staff was Bill Slim. And bookmarking that is, is, you know, being at the end of that long and distinguished line is extraordinary. But I guess the overriding sense was one of deep pride and, and also a sense of affection. You know, pride in our soldiers, pride in the sailors and the airmen who all took part and did so very well uh, during the funeral and during Op Bridge but affection for the British people and for all those who came from the Commonwealth, because you couldn't help but feel that if you were wandering around central London during those days and those weeks. And in particular, if you engaged with people who were in the queue, there was just a, an extraordinary sense of national mourning, but also national pride, and the nation really came together. So it was a remarkable thing to have experienced, and I feel very privileged to just be in that remarkable position after so long to have been involved in the burial of... His Royal Highness, Her Majesty, and then, of course, the coronation next year. Mm, thanks very much. A very, a very affecting experience by, by the sound of it. My, my second question, I suppose, is to focus more on, uh, on the Army's participation and its very obvious presence in the, uh, in, in the, in the ceremony. Um, all, all the services were involved, quite clearly. But I wonder uh, what you thought, uh, as its professional head, I wonder what you thought of the role played by the army and in particular what what do you think was the impression that the army made in the UK and internationally how do you respond to those who suggested and I think some who still suggest that impressive and very stirring though these uh, various events were what we saw was an army that is splendid at ceremonial and pageantry but has begun to lose its edge and its reputation as a fighting force how would you respond to that so I think I'd use some Anglo-Saxon and uh, suggest that, uh, that that thought is is nothing but bollocks. If you think that all we do is practice drill, you're mistaken. The vast majority of people who were on that parade had done little or no preparation. Some of them had done no rifle drill at all. And it was down to the very high professional standards that all of the armed forces, in my case, I think the army did very well. And if you just think about the composition of both of those extraordinary groups of of young men who were the Bearer Party, you know, the Bearer Party in Scotland and then the Bearer Party in London for Bridge itself, you know, those are professional soldiers. Um, And the Bearer Party from the Queen's Company who came out, who who were involved at Westminster Abbey, uh, we brought back from Iraq where they were on operations. 
So you saw both ends of the spectrum, you know, young men from different backgrounds who came together and just displayed the most, the highest standards of, of discipline and of professional behaviour. And of course, I could point to the things that I think that the British Army, not just us, but to a very large extent, the British Army has been involved in over the last year, year and a half, that gives us pride in, in the professional standards we set, you know, Operation Pitting. You know, none of us wanted Afghanistan to end that way, but my goodness, it was a, an evacuation operation that was conducted in the face of the enemy and done extremely well. The impact that we're having on the war in Ukraine, whether that is professional advice and supplying material, but in particular the training, the way that the nation turned to us during COVID. So I think that you know, this is an army that I'm intensely proud of. Uh, having said all of that, you know, your point about losing our edge and, and whether or not you know, our reputation is deserved, I think our reputation is deserved, but I'm not complacent. You know, this is an army that is gusting quite small. It's got a lot of ageing equipment. And if we fell back on complacency, then there's a very real risk that we would fall behind uh, our enemies, but, but also potentially our peers. And, and it's part of my job to make sure that I argue the case that we reset that. You joined the army in 1984. You've served on operations in Northern Ireland, the Balkans, Iraq and Afghanistan. You've commanded at infantry, battalion, armoured brigade and divisional levels. And then you became commander of the field army in 2016. In 2019, you were appointed commander of Joint Forces Command, which was later renamed Strategic Command. And then in June of this year, you became the chief of the general staff. What we're looking at is an immensely successful career as a soldier. But I know as well that you've also got a demonstrable interest in changing geopolitical, social and technological contexts in which armed forces in general, and obviously particularly the army, are employed and deployed. When your appointment as CGS was announced in February of this year, before taking up your appointment actually uh, just four months ago, there were mutterings. Uh, about what you would bring with you from the digital world of strategic command to the real world, the real life of the army? Were you about to digitise the army? First of all, what did you bring with you from strategic command to the army? And second, what did you not bring with you? You're on record for saying that you can't use cyber to cross a river, and I wonder whether that was a difficult admission for you to make, uh, a necessary one in the process of transferring from strategic command to the army. Well, first of all, I'd be doing my predecessors a disservice if I allowed you to sort of suggest that the army wasn't in the process of embracing digitisation and data before I got there. But I guess I would point to three things that I very consciously tried to bring with me from Strategic Command. And it was an extraordinary privilege um, to have spent three years commanding um, a remarkable organisation that spans all of defence and some of its most strategic assets. And the first is an understanding of the importance of digitisation and in particular of data. Though I'll come back to the sort of cyber way across a river point in a second. For all that we can point to the constants of warfare that are playing out in front of us in Ukraine, it's also giving us an insight into the future of warfare. And it is, to a very large extent, you know, the most exciting developments, the most transformational things that are happening in that war are involving data. Now, there is a limit to how much I can go into, but if you can think in terms of how you can harness the power of data and open source information using algorithms and artificial intelligence and cloud-based computing and the sort of sensor networks and bearer networks that, that satellite technology gives you, it points to how quickly you can make a battlefield transparent and how rapidly you can begin to increase the speed and the fidelity of targeting at, at levels that we simply have not seen in any other war. I think that for all that we've seen a lot of, of dirt and armour and artillery, we've also seen some extraordinary transformation in the exploitation of data. And so this isn't something that we point to the future and say in the 2030s, we'll be conducting algorithmic warfare. It's happening already. I think the second thing I brought with me really was a profound understanding of the importance of operating across and with other domains. So if combined arms manoeuvre was the solution to breaking the deadlock in the trenches in uh, 1917 and 1918, and has been in many respects our USP, one of our areas of expertise, so that extends to how you operate across the domains. Now, the enablers to make that happen are still evolving and still developing, although again, on this war, we've seen how quickly you can shift on that. But multi-domain operations, if the army is not thinking in terms of how it can draw on the other domains and that power of digitization that I was describing earlier on to ensure that when it is fighting on land, it can be supported, 
but also is thinking in terms of when it is fighting from the land, it is supporting other domains, then, then we're missing a trick. And then I guess the third thing I wanted to bring with me was a sense that the army could afford to be more extrovert to be more integrated with its sister services uh, and government, but also more global in outlook and ambition, because we've been quite introspective, I think, uh, over the last decade or two, and we need to raise our sights slightly. To your point about what I didn't bring with me, you've written a magnificent book on the future of warfare. And, and one of the things that you know, you've identified, and we all could, we have a slight habit when it comes to predicting the future of warfare and fetishizing technology. And you know, perhaps I've been slightly guilty of that earlier on. And I think you know, we would be wrong not to try to remain at the cutting edge of emerging and disruptive technologies, um, not least because we'll get our asses handed to us if we don't. But what Ukraine does remind us all, and, and you know, we are guilty in the West of having forgotten, is some of the constants um, of warfare. You know, geography just matters, terrain matters, fortunes can be decided on whether or not you can get across a river. The levels of attrition, no matter how sophisticated or smart you might be, Warfare involves attrition. It involves logistics and stockpiles, having a sovereign industrial base that can support you. It involves having protection, whether you're fighting in a city or in a trench, you need to be able to manoeuvre in a way that is protected. And then it involves the intangibles, you know, morale, the effect that a charismatic, smart leader can have on a formation at whatever level, from section all the way up to core, can be absolutely catalytic. You saw that with the Ukrainian breakout recently in Kharkiv and that phenomenal exploitation. And then finally, skill, you know, just the importance of training repetitively and perfecting this business of making sure that you can combine arms, you can combine domains. And if we lose our edge in, in training, we'll lose it on the battlefield. I was struck by two things you said. The first is that algorithmic warfare is happening already. And the second was the sense that actually the army, like all armed services, in a way have to become digitally capable and digitally empowered. Both of those were very prominent themes in a conference I attended just last week at Wilton Park on the future of warfare and deterrence. The 2021 Integrated Review of Security, Defence, Development and Foreign Policy, the IR, is currently being re-examined. Uh, I think there's possibly widespread interest in seeing what the review of the review, so to speak, will produce. Uh, and I think there is a, a certain amount of speculation building up as to the outcome, uh, not least in the light of the promise of a of 3% of GDP going to defence, as the outcome of the review of the review for the size and the shape and the capability of, of all services, obviously including the British Army. So my first question in this regard concerns the size of the British Army. And it is a rather blunt question. It's a blunt issue. You know, as you were just saying, you know, technology and algorithmic warfare and, all, and so on are all uh, shaping the way we must think about the future of warfare. But in a sense, we've, we've got to begin this whole discussion by looking at this, uh, the issue of bulk. And the question is this, if the army remains in the low 70,000s, will it be big enough to, uh, to meet the challenges we might expect it to meet. And I, I'm asking this question really deliberately uh, in the way I did, without, first of all, naming specific challenges, largely because some people would say that the integrated review of last year was, was caught by surprise uh, in Ukraine in February this year. So we're concerning ourselves, in a sense, with, uh, and inevitably, with, with impressions and judgments about what the future might hold. And that's something I'll come back to later. So as the Chief of the General Staff, is it your sense that the Army is big enough and that it will be after the review? Are you happy with the way it is and the, and the way the future might look? So, so I'll get to a direct answer at the end, but just, just allow me to, to pick some of that part. So, so first of all, um, you said the, the low 70,000s. Of course, the Army is closer to 100,000 because we mustn't lose sight of the reservists and, of course, the regular reserve, who are the sort of strategic baseline that we have, you know, those people who have served before and have a call-up duty. The second thing I'd say is that one of the interesting things about what's playing out in front of us in Ukraine is not that you don't need armies of a certain size, but one of the things that Western nations, really high-end Western armies, might be able to do is to enable other people to fight. So that's not to suggest that in all circumstances, you will be able to develop a proxy force and they can do the hard yards for you. But it might just be that the smartest way to defeat your enemies is through other people's capability by bringing the sort of skills and technology and high-end capabilities that we have to augment and support partners. And, and that is precisely really what is happening in Ukraine at the moment. It's not just the supply of materiel and ammunition, 
But it's what I was hinting at earlier on. It, it's the targeting, it's the use of long-range precision fires to begin to pick apart, in this case, the Russian echelons. We are sooner or later find ourselves having a responsibility to be able to do some straightforward things on, on land warfare. It's defending objectives, securing pieces of terrain or retaking them. And that does require armies of a certain size. Now, you could point to history probably more accurately than I can that points to where small armies have defeated large armies. So it isn't just about scale and size and industrial strength. It is about skill. It is about lethality. It is about a philosophy of command, in our case, mission command, that really makes the most of the small unit initiative that can create small successes on the battlefield. Again, we saw that very effectively in Ukraine. And then, of course, our, our, our strategic culture is not one of being wedded to large continental armies. We have, you know, on occasion needed to do that, but our strategic culture is much more little heart. It is much more about trying to find an indirect approach to pick apart and attack enemies' weaknesses rather than confronting their strengths. And I wouldn't go sort of full Corbett and say that the British have always espoused a maritime strategy, but drawing on the sort of Chinese, I, I do think that we've you know, we've perhaps espoused a maritime strategy with British characteristics, and that has involved an army that is able to have effect on land. But not to duck your question, mass matters, resilience matters. You know, the Ukrainians' casualties have exceeded the size of the British infantry. Regeneration matters, and you are only as strong as your weakest domain. And so we need, as we sign up to our NATO commitments, and particularly the ones that will emerge following Madrid around the new force model, then we need to be very clear that we match the commitments that we are making to NATO, whatever size or scale they are, and that we are serious about them and that they are force driving. So that's a very long-winded way of saying that I'm more focused on capability than I am size or numbers. But to repeat what I said at Rusi, it does seem perverse to be reducing the size of the army in the face of this threat, in the face of what NATO is likely to be asking and in the face of an uncertain world. And I'm not going to point to a figure of what the army should look like, but it is one that should be lethal and should be sufficiently resilient and draws on a very strong and healthy reserve. I'm also very interested in the, the way our strategic culture has developed through history. And I certainly understand and appreciate the, the indirect approach and, and the notion that this is somehow in the DNA of the British Army in particular, the indirect approach. I can't overlook the fact that for well over 50 years, We've combined that cultural approach, the indirect approach, with the bald fact of having a very large presence on the European continent. I do think we've developed some kind of a hybrid between the little heart approach uh, and the, the notion of mass on the ground in Europe. But can I come on to the, the question of focus? And the question is this, where should the British Army be focused uh, strategically and certainly operationally? mainly or perhaps wholly on, on the security and defence of the UK? What about the Euro-Atlantic? What about the Indo-Pacific? What about the whole of the world? Where do you see the army looking uh, as its priority? Well, the first and the most obvious point to make is that security starts at home. And if we weren't focused on protecting the UK and the homeland, uh, whatever form that takes, and the government is working through, you know, in the face of greater threats, exactly what that would look like, then, then protecting the UK is the first priority. But that sits within a Euro-Atlantic context. You know, we're not we're not a, well, we are an island, but we're not divorced from the main. And so you link the protection of the UK to the secure, security and defence of the Euro-Atlantic area. So we have to be first, you know, acknowledging that the, the integrated review, uh, and I don't think the IR uh, review, the review of the review will change this, um, will emphasise that uh, our primary responsibility is the defence and security of the Euro-Atlantic area, and that means ensuring that we can meet our commitments in NATO. Um, it's going to mean for the British Army that whatever particular role we are committed to, and the Supreme Air Command of Europe is working through the regional plans and the domain plans, um, whether we are in a manoeuvring or a counter-strike role, or whether, whether we are allocated to a particular area, it's going to require some element of forward basing. And we have been very, very... Um, uh, I think we've been very strong on pointing to the importance of forward defence um, as a means of deterrence. Uh, and that really came through as a theme at, um, uh, at Madrid. But that's not to say that we're exclusively, you know, that, that's an exclusive thing. You know, we are 
we have the ambition to be a global power. And a global power, just as it needs a globally engaged Navy, it needs an Air Force that can operate around, it needs a globally engaged Army as well. So that you are getting upstream of threats, but also seizing opportunities. So it is about establishing strategic partnerships in crucial parts of the world with like-minded countries. We've done that historically in the Middle East. We might also choose to do it in other parts of the world, whether it's the Indo-Pacific or in Africa. And that is both about promoting and securing our own long-term security and interests by having these very long-term partnerships, but also being able to constrain the activities of, uh, of China and of Russia in parts of the world where there might be national resources or just might be our, our interests are engaged. And, and you could point to Africa. So we're about you know, using that global presence to promote uh, influence, to promote national prosperity. And I think that focused though we will be, and particularly in the near term on the Euro-Atlantic area, we have to simultaneously be engaged in growing those partnerships in the Indo-Pacific as well. And we have to be able to offer options and effects in the Indo-Pacific. You know, it's unthinkable to me that if well, the world did find itself witnessing a confrontation with China, that we wouldn't be playing some part of a role in that. And I think I have to be able to offer a contribution in the land domain. There's a string of what I call balancing questions, finding the right balance between, for example, the human and the machine uh, mass and the multiplier of that mass. You can't keep multiplying a diminishing mass because you end up with no mass and therefore ineffective multiplication. The platform versus the system, uh, national versus allied and the idea of interoperability and so on. But I suppose my question is, as you, as the head of the army, are looking at all of these contending arguments, how how do you go about deciding how to balance them? In other words, what's the What's the priority in your mind? Is it to achieve either manoeuvrability or impact or a value for money? How do, you, how do you go about it? So I think the thing that I would privilege above all else is lethality, because I think that we have insufficient lethality as an army. The army that we have today is born of decisions that we made in the 1980s for a particular threat. And then with the intervening period, we were knocked off course by the you know, stabilisation and counterinsurgency campaigns and so we are left with an armory, if you like, that is insufficiently lethal and that privileges the close, if you think of deep close rear as a, as a construct, privileges close combat over deep being able to reach out at range. And, and by range, I'm not just talking in tens of kilometres in the way that, uh, that HIMARS and GMLRS can do, but I'm thinking in terms of hundreds of kilometres in the way that hypersonics might be able to. And, and indeed our rear, our logistics and our sustainment. So in balancing, and, and my predecessor, uh, Mark Carlton-Smith, uh, sought to get after this um, uh, under the Future Soldier Programme, which is the army that emerged from the IR. You know, he was consciously privileging the deep and restoring some of that strength to the rear. I think he was exactly right to do so, uh, and we're continuing with that. But you know, the other balance is... So if you want the British Army to be able to deliver this global effect, it has to, it has to have strategic and operational mobility. It has to be expeditionary. Uh, you can't, you know, we haven't yet invented time travel. Um, and so we can't magic the whole of the army or, or fighting formations to the right spot on the battlefield in enough time to deter or nip something in the bud. So that requires a degree, an element of forward basing when you have some certainty about what the priorities are. And that, in turn means that you need some agility so that you can transition from these, uh, these activities, these operations where we're engaged in competing and constraining to then re-aggregate uh, at pace to, to meet a crisis. And then the other balance that is worth drawing through is the extent to which we fight on land or from the land. Now, I think you can do both, but I need to design an army that in being able to fight and win is part of an alliance construct on land, more lethal, more agile, you know, learning lots of the lessons that we've seen playing out in front of us from Ukraine, it also needs to be able to provide supporting effect from the land. So that whether it's in the Gulf or whether it's in the Indo-Pacific, you can, you can put land counters down on the map or on the chart, which can provide support to maritime and air maneuver and secure and deny choke points. And that has to be a role that I think the British Army can play into. And one other balancing act that, that I find of particular interest is the, the dreaded wheels versus tracks debate. Um, last month I visited the DVD exhibition as a guest of RBSL and I was very interested then among other things to see a prototype of Challenger 3 on display and especially interested to see the several variants of the Boxer wheeled armoured vehicle. Tracks 
and wheels or tracks versus wheels. And I wonder whether these very different conceptions of armoured mobility can be balanced in one force. In, in May this year, I noticed an article in the Daily Telegraph. The title was Why the Invasion of Ukraine Spells the End of Modern Tank Warfare. So it gives the, gives the game away, really. But the author argued that the British Army maintains uh, what was called a 1980s pre-smart weapons view of land warfare and suggested that the time had come for the Army to abandon tracked armoured vehicles in favour of other more agile and more capable platforms. So sort of my question is, you know, was he right? And what would be your preference? Uh, and indeed, do you like tanks? Well, I'm not sure I like tanks as much as you do, Paul, but uh, I do like tanks, yes. Um, so I was at, uh, at RBSL's production facility, its plant, in Telford just a week ago and saw the first prototypes of the Challenger 3 up there. Although it's an upgrade, it will be a world-leading tank. It will be the first digital turret, the lethality, the protection it has, its fire control system. Uh, you know, it'll be an extraordinarily capable vehicle. And for people who are in the market, a knockdown price compared to a brand new Leopard 2. But anyway, I'll stop the marketing. So I think, again, and I don't want to do tr draw too much purely from Ukraine. So let's broaden the, the aperture. If you look at the most recent conflicts we've seen playing out in front of us on land, so... Ukraine, obviously, but also Nagorno-Karabakh and Syria and, and Libya. It points to the fact that, that armour will have an enduring role and tanks will have an enduring role well into the future. Indeed, the Poles are investing in up to about a 1,000 tanks because of the particular circumstances they're in. But the tank cannot operate purely on its own. And so it's the combination with, with infantry and with other arms that is the skill in using that in a combined arms way that enables you uh, to achieve the right effect. Uh, and that's been, you know, if you looked at the start of the campaign when Lewis Page wrote that article, you would say, armoured warfare is dead, the tank is dead. And then if you look towards the end of this campaign and indeed to the end of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, the breakthroughs were achieved with tanks and with armour. So it's about how you use them. And you, you need a certain, a minimum number of the sort of protected firepower, direct firepower that armour can give you on the battlefield. And the Israelis, perhaps at the most acute threat, find that as well. I always think the wheels versus tracks thing is a bit of a is a bit of a distraction. So you need, particularly for the sort of army that I think the British Army will need to be, you absolutely need uh, operational mobility. The supposed trade-off between tactical mobility and operational mobility, I, I, I don't see anymore. If you look at how that boxer that you saw at, at Millbrook performed, it's got as good cross-country mobility and in some cases better than tracks. So that part of the debate goes away. So I think, you know, you need tracks for some things. You'll always need tracks on a tank. But for the rest, I'm inclined to think that wheels will probably do because it allows you to, to shoot and scoot in a way that the, that the Ukrainians are doing with, with their artillery. In July this year, you warned in a speech that the army must prepare, quote, to fight in Europe once again. It was a very stark observation. It certainly captured the imagination uh, and the attention of, of the media. Uh, and I actually wrote about it. I welcomed it as the basis of... Uh, of of a return to conventional deterrence thinking. And I described it as continuous on land deterrence, which was obviously a little spin on uh, continuous at sea deterrence. There we are. Um, and I wonder whether deterrence is what you had or have in mind. And, and if so, are you confident that the British Army can deter? And if so, what can it deter? Uh, where and for how long? How big is deterrence in your outlook? As I said in, the, in that speech, this was entirely about deterrence. It was not about going to war or starting a war. It was about deterring a war against this very acute threat that we're facing. And no matter how degraded, and they are very degraded, the Russians have been, it will remain a very powerful and potentially lethal nation. And they, are, they have shown historically that they can regenerate at a rate that surprises people. But the, for me, the, you know, it goes back to what I was saying about, about forward defence. What you can't afford to do nowadays is to lose the first battle. Because once you've lost the first battle, I mean the first defensive battle, you are going to be on the back foot. And the amount of political will and capital and the amount of blood and treasure that you will need to invest to, to regain territory that politically is necessary will be incredibly costly. So it means you've got to have an army within an alliance context. We don't have to be the biggest army in NATO. We're not the biggest army in NATO by some, by some stretch. But we need to be able... To, to, to meet the demand signal that NATO puts on us and that we offer. And so don't lose the first battle. It means you've got to be strategically responsive. It means that you've got to be engaged in forward defence. It also means that you're probably 
um, going to be looking uh, at a defensive posture and that you should be exploiting the advantages that complex terrain offers. And by complex terrain, I mean most frequently urban. You know, urban uh, environments, cities, towns are going to be objectives, but in an area of very, very dispersed armies on a transparent battlefield, there are also going to be places that you can hide and you can secure. And then I guess the second sort of thing behind deterrence is that you've got to be combat credible. We know that credibility is a critical component of deterrence. I think it was Thomas Mann that said that, no, Thomas Schelling, who said that credibility is the only thing that is worth fighting for. Uh, and that means being lethal, as the way I described earlier on. It means being resilient, so that that credibility means you will last for more than a few days. It means being able to inflict attrition at reach. And it means being hard to find and hard to kill and, and drawing you into an urban terrain. It was reported in June of this year that you held up the deployment of a battalion on the grounds of internal discipline. Now, I'm not going to try and draw you into that. I don't, I don't want to go into the detail of that, but I wonder whether I can use that to ask a much more broader question, which is whether you're able uh, to comment on the character and the morale of the, of the army in general. The things I'm thinking of as I ask that question are recruitment and retention, uh, the quality of training, uh, questions of diversity and inclusion, because just last week, I think I saw reported in the paper that the army is still having to put up, sorry, women in the army are still having to put up with equipment that doesn't fit. There are also questions of of leadership. Um, does the, what I call the, the alchemy of British army leadership still work as it should? What I mean by that is the relationship between uh, young officers, especially young officers on the one hand, and senior non-commissioned officers and warrant officers on the other hand. And Santos, the role of Santos in all of this, it's been described, it's often described uh, as the crucible of British Army leadership. So what is Santos's role in developing and maintaining standards of leadership in the Army? And sorry, it's one final point. This is a very long question, uh, a difficult and delicate question. But actually, I know that I know it's one that's very important to you. Uh, and it's this, is the Army as aware of and responsive to matters of mental health uh, as it should be? So, so when I came into this job, I, I was pretty clear that I was going to have two priorities that dominated my tenure. One was to mobilise the army so that it would be, I could pass on to my successor an army that could at least fight and be focused on winning wars on land. And that's a clear statement of our purpose in, in two or three years' time. But I also knew that the other thing that I would be focusing on, because the moral strength, the character of the army is so important, and, and, and that was our culture. If you see us as others see ourselves, then on one hand, there is much to be cheerful about. So the thing that armies around the world beat a path to our door for is our doctrine, our professional military education, the courses, the training we offer, and the standards and example that is set by our officers who are always punch above their weight in whichever headquarters they're serving in with which other nation. I mean, it's, it's repaid back to me all the time. And the quality of our NCOs, you know, the very backbone of the British Army. So the Indians, you know, rightly have a great deal of pride in their own army and, and their own equipment capabilities and their own industry. The thing that they're most interested from us is attendance on these courses. So the basic character and standards and discipline of the British Army is viewed very, very highly by, by all our peers and indeed by our enemies. But on the other hand, we have evidence from within the army and from people who have who've conducted reviews that suggests that all is not well. So we had Sarah Afton's report in the House of Commons Defence Select Committee that looked at the experience of women in the armed forces. We have Mike Wigston's review. And then we've had um, some terrible incidents, which we're dealing with at the moment, whether that's the death of Agnes Wanjiru in Kenya or indeed the death of Officer Cadet Perks at Sandhurst. And, and those are... I mean, I cannot tell you how much pain and grief it, it gives me as the head of the army to read what went wrong in those cases. And that's as nothing compared to, obviously, how the families felt with it as well. So I think there's many things to admire about our culture, about the values and the standards that we represent. But it's not perfect. And it's an effort of constant and continuous improvement. And we have done a lot in this area. So, you know, this sounds a bit bureaucratic, but... But I think Sarah Afton and the House of Commons Defence Select Kitty Meet Committee made 22 really quite hefty recommendations and we have got after uh, 20 of those 22. So, for example, you know, we have 180 degree reporting. Other, that's quite new for us. It's not been for other industries. We, we put our, uh, our brigade commanders and commanding officers through an incredibly rigorous 
selection process, not based on reports, but actually on a day where they're subjected to quite high degrees of stress and pressure, and we assess how they perform, and it informs whether or not we think they're, they're fit for, for command appointments. And I could go on like that. So this is a continuous journey. My predecessor, Mark Carlton Smith, established an initiative called uh, Operation Teamwork, and that has permeated through the whole of the army as a way of exploring our culture, holding a mirror up to ourselves, making sure that the, the environment we create from the most junior, junior to the most senior level is one that fosters a culture of professionalism and teamwork. And I, I it, you know, it is one of the two highest priorities I have. So, you know, we draw from across society, you know, we have 100,000 people in the British Army, and some of those will make some really bad mistakes and some really bad calls. And, and I won't be able to change that, but I might be able to reduce the incidence of it and make sure that our culture is something that the country can be proud of. And I think broadly it is. Thank you very much, General. Can we finish with an easy question? The future. I like to say that national strategy for security and defence is informed by the past, by our long history, globally and in Europe and nationally and so on, informed by the past and shaped by the present. Uh, What are we doing at the moment and why and all the urgencies and challenges that come up. But fundamentally, national strategy, to the extent that it's actually about preparing, must be concerned with uh, the future. Although you, even as the Chief of the General Staff, can't predict the future, or perhaps you can, I don't know, perhaps there's uh, something going on in your office that nobody knows about. You can't predict the strategic future. But in a way, the irony or the challenge is that you have to engage with it nevertheless. You have to be, I should think, uh, concerned with and even worrying about the future. So what do you, General Sir Patrick Sanders, what do you think the future might hold for the UK, for European and international security, and within that for the British Army? As I said, this is a fairly straightforward question. So I'm going to answer this with a dose of humility. We've never been good at future gazing and, uh, and I'm not sure that I'm necessarily any better qualified than anybody else. I mean, it's easy to be bleak, isn't it? There's a lot to be bleak about, particularly if, uh, like you or me, you are paid to worry about the future, worry about defence and worry about security. So I'm going to slightly duck the question and, and I'm going to say, and I, I believe this, that I think that fundamentally we have cause for optimism. So if you look at what's happened just over the last six months or so, I think the UK has shown as a nation that despite a narrative of decline, which you can read, pick any paper, pick any day, we can still lead. We can still set the agenda. And the fact that we've been prepared to take so much political risk on an issue of principle has galvanised the world's and the West's response against uh, Putin's actions in Ukraine. And that is genuine national leadership. I think as a country, we have some enviable advantages. You know, I pointed to aspects of our military soft power, but we have extraordinary soft power weight as a country. I think we routinely rank in the top three countries in the world, level pegging with France, sometimes ahead, sometimes behind. But our science and technology base, even if it's not necessarily fully harnessed nationally as a sort of source of startups and unicorns, is extraordinary. And we have, we have a magnetism as a country, which you and I may not think we deserve, but lots of other people in the world do. So I think ultimately, pull the lens out, I, th- I think Europe and Ukraine will prevail. I think it's going to be lumpy. I think it's going to take some skill to navigate our way through a particularly dangerous shoal over the next few months or so. But all of that is founded on, you know, first of all, the strength of our economy, and I'm not going to comment on the economic projections, it's not my business, the strength of our industrial base, and in particular uh, our defence industrial base, uh, and the strength of our hard power. So when I look to the future, um, uh, I, have, uh, I have a vision, I have, I have optimism for an army that, that projects UK influence globally, you know, is faithful to its friends uh, and confounds its enemies, both in peace and war, um, one that has regenerated our land industrial base. I think it's one of the biggest mistakes that we've made. When you look back to what we have with Elvis and Vickers and that great industrial base, we don't have it anymore. Well, I think one of my jobs is to lay the foundations for that. And then from that, ensure that the nation prospers. You know, an army that that has lethality, that has expeditionary capability and the ability to deter and win the first offensive battle. An army that has the resilience to endure Uh, an army that harnesses the potential of data in a way I was talking about at the top of this podcast, 
that can fight and win on land, but can provide support and effects from the land, and that offers adventure and a fulfilling career, and that is, as it is today, a true engine of social mobility. Thank you very much, General. If I may say, a very measured and reasonable response to a, a ridiculously open-ended question. And you said that fundamentally we have cause for optimism. Actually, I, I agree. I, but I go probably go one step further, and I'd, I'd almost argue that it's when things are at their most bleak and dismal um, and nothing seems to be going right that you have to actually force yourself to be optimistic because you know it's in there somewhere. So, yeah, I'm with you on that, absolutely. But, look, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our conversation. Another excellent podcast. Thank you very much uh, once again for your time and your insights. General Sir Patrick Sanders, Chief of the General Staff, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Paul. For the second part of our podcast, I'd like to welcome a very long-standing friend of City Forum, Frank Kramer. Frank is a distinguished fellow and board member of the Atlantic Council based in Washington, D.C., and a former Assistant Secretary of Defence for International Security Affairs in the U.S. Department of Defence. Frank is a noted author and analyst in matters of international security and strategy, with a very keen interest in NATO and Europe. Frank, you very kindly agreed to offer your thoughts on the conversation I had earlier with General Sir Patrick Sanders, the UK Chief of the General Staff. I think in a way we couldn't invite anybody better than you, more qualified than you, to give that comment. We covered a great deal of ground, and I wonder what struck you about what you heard. Paul, thank you very much. It's a a real pleasure to be here. It's a great chance to talk with you again. Uh, It will not surprise you that uh, I thought the conversation was uh, very valuable and uh, covered a lot of very important points. Uh, I am very broadly speaking uh, in full accord with the general, uh, but I do have some observations uh, from this side of the pond, so to speak. First thing I would say, and of course General Sanders underscored this, is if one had to pick one thing, uh, it's people. Um, And he referenced people in a number of of circumstances. I, myself, uh, over the years, have generally been very impressed with the high quality of people, both the enlisted and the officers uh, throughout the UK military. And the ability, I think, to meet an unplanned challenge, a particular example, of course, was the uh, Queen's funeral. But other examples include the uh, training uh, that's been done with respect to Ukraine. And I think that maintaining the quality of people is the single most important thing that UK and for that matter US uh, militaries and others uh, allies can do. Uh, I'm not sure where things stand in terms of recruitment in the UK. We're facing some challenges here in the US and I think one of the things that we all need to do is to ensure that we keep up the high quality of recruitment across the board. The general mentioned one point on size versus quality. Um, And he underscored the fact that the UK has approximately, I think, 100,000 personnel uh, in the Army Reserve. That, I think, is a contribution that's often overlooked. We, of course, have uh, reserves here, uh, both the reserves themselves and and our so-called National Guard, each able to complement the active duty military. The point I would make about the reserves, especially in the context of a potential European conflict, is they also have to have high quality capabilities. In terms of the size of the UK Army uh, and the military in general, I think it's worth noting that the UK will fight in an alliance or in a coalition with others. And so while quantity does matter, there's an old saying that quantity has a quality all of its own, I think it's very important that there be an appropriate quality to that quantity And if I had to pick, I'd prefer not to have to pick, but if I had to pick, I would say it's very important to ensure that the coalition as a whole or the alliance as a whole has the adequate quantity, uh, but that quality uh, be maintained. And I think UK can be a leading edge uh, with respect to high quality of forces, uh, high quality of advanced capabilities. And one of the things, again, that the general mentioned was the use of data, of information. Now, information has always been important. Uh, You go back to Joshua and the spies and the Bible and the like, but it's even more important these days. The technical or jargon term is uh, ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Um, As the general pointed out, the the key is not just get it, uh, but be able to use it and to use it promptly. 
And uh, his phrase, if I recall correctly, was how to make the battlefield transparent quickly and to have speed and fidelity in targeting. I think we've seen how important that is in the context of Ukraine. I think we can do a lot more. Uh, There's a concept, at least in the U.S., I expect that uh, people in the U.K. are also thinking about it. It's sometimes been called mesh networks. The idea simply being that a lot of sensor drones, hopefully inexpensive, uh, so that they can be, you know, utilized in a large amount, uh, a lot of sensor drones up in the air looking down at the battlefield uh, and being able to provide information to whoever, uh, whatever set of forces can bring lethality to bear. Uh, that kind of uh, integrated approach, uh, I think, is something that needs to continue to be developed. Uh, we've seen examples of that at the, I'll call it the lower tech, but nonetheless uh, very worthwhile activities by the Ukraine forces, uh, an earlier version, of course, in the uh, Azerbaijan uh, Armenia fight. But the point that the journal made about uh, the criticality of data, I think, deserves a lot of thought and a lot of engagement with industry as to how to make that as useful as potentially could be the case. That brings one, I think, to the idea of multi-domain. And again, the general was clear. uh, The Army needs to draw on other areas and it needs to support other areas. Again, in the U.S., uh, what we have seen is the U.S. Army uh, talking a lot about multi-domain operations, and we've got a broader concept for uh, all forces, uh, which we call Joint All-Domain Command and Control. We have the words. uh, We haven't yet gotten to the actuality. And so I think this is one thing that we really want to work on together with UK. Uh, There's an industry element uh, to make sure that the technology is available. There's a... uh, operational element, if you will. How does this really work? Uh, There's an analytic element. How do you figure out uh, which set of capabilities needs to be provided, and how does one do that in the context of an ongoing fight? Um, It's not just, you know, one shot. It's ongoing and continuous. So I think that's a, a really difficult challenge. It's a place where I think we can use uh, artificial intelligence uh, to support uh, human intelligence. Um, I'm a big believer in the value of artificial intelligence, but I also think humans need to be engaged in the loop. Um, And so this is an evolving area, I think, uh, beyond what we have now. um, It's well beyond uh, the concept that we had in the Cold War, uh, both the UK and the US working together in what we then called the air land battle. Uh, because this is really all domain. But it's not, and again, the General Sanders underscored this, it's not all technology. Uh, It's logistics, uh, it's stockpiles, uh, it's being able to deal with attrition, it's understanding sustainability, uh, it's understanding mobility. And again, all of these uh, sets of issues uh, are important. And ultimately, what we want to have occur, of course, is we want to deter the war. We don't really want to fight it. We want to win if we fight it, but we don't want to have to fight it. And so we want to present a united front, uh, certainly in Europe, to Russia, uh, which demonstrates that we really would be able to prevail, and prevail significantly. One element, and there's a NATO Ministers of Defense meeting ongoing as we speak, one element that's really important is to have industrial participation that can support these requirements. The Secretary General of NATO spoke in his introductory remarks, introductory press conference, uh, about utilizing uh, what NATO calls the defense planning process, NATO's requirements process, to show industry that there's going to be a series of requirements and to give industry an understanding of what those requirements will be and to have the understanding that the requirements will go on sufficiently so that it makes sense from a point of view of a company to create the capability to provide a substantial amount over time. I think that's an important change. Uh, We haven't had the sustainability in a lot of forces. I don't know the specifics of the UK. I do know that the European Union uh, did a recent report and it talked about the fact that the forces, uh, national forces uh, that are uh, made up the nations of the European Union lack sustainability and that it's terribly important to increase that. It seems to me that that really is important. And again, I want to underscore uh, the importance of industry's involvement. 
There's also an element, a different element of industry, which is not specific to the Army, but it's specific to war fighting. And that is we all depend on critical infrastructures. And in particular, one could underscore the importance of the electric grid, uh, energy pipelines, uh, air, rail, ports. Uh, we just saw the recent uh, situation in Germany where the rail lines uh, were unable to operate for a while because uh, several cables were cut. We need to think through very clearly how to enhance the resilience of critical infrastructures because it's not just the forces, it's the critical infrastructures that are necessary to what I'll call defense mission assurance. There's been a lot of conversation uh, in that regard about cybersecurity, um, and I think that conversation is appropriate, but as what happened in Germany underscores, it's not just cyber, it's also physical damage that, that could occur. So the private sector's role uh, in war is important. And again, while this is a little bit off of the Army side, one of the other things we've seen in Ukraine is the private sector actually in the fight, particularly in cybersecurity. So whether it's Microsoft or Cisco, or uh, there's a Slovak firm, I believe it's uh, called ESET, uh, all supporting uh, maintaining the ongoing capability of Ukraine to have its information technology up and running. And then, of course, similarly, uh, the Starlink terminals uh, that are there. So again, I think we can expect uh, to think hard about uh, the engagement with private industry, uh, both for critical infrastructures, uh, for, for support in an ongoing war. There's a issue of how much is enough. That's always an issue for the for militaries. Um, some conversation, uh, I, I guess it goes beyond conversation. The, the new government, if that's the right way to describe it, uh, in UK has talked about you know, significantly increasing defense spending. I think that spending is critical. I mentioned already on personnel and how that might relate to recruitment and high quality people. We also need to think a lot about what kind of spending I think we've seen in Ukraine, for example, uh, the value of long-range fires, the value of unmanned aerial vehicles. General Sanders underscored the importance of mobility. Um, that might involve pre-positioning equipment, forces, but also the ability to get to where everyone wants to, so logistical capabilities. So again, I think I, I won't describe for UK what ought to be spent. I think that's a national decision that one has to make. But I do think that having a necessary level of spending to meet the requirements, especially given that the Russians have shown a, a uh, I think it was an unexpected uh, decision, uh, if one goes back a year or so, to, to go to war. And so I think we really do need to enhance deterrence, uh, particularly for the frontline states uh, all the way from the north, hopefully soon to include uh, Sweden and Finland, the Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, and in the south, uh, the Mediterranean and the like. So right level of spending, terribly important. And then the question of where does the British Army or British military, for that matter, focus? And the short answer to that, I think, is the main area, I think, needs to be Europe. The main coalition, if that's the word, alliance, needs to be NATO. The entire Euro-Atlantic area, I think there needs to be some forward basing. Um, but that doesn't mean that it can't have some important and useful roles elsewhere. Uh, obviously, we're all thinking hard about China. Uh, UK has entered into a, an alliance, a so-called AUKUS, Australia, UK, United States. Thinking through uh, what that involves beyond nuclear submarines, I think is important. And so sorting out what would be most important, and there are other theaters. We are truly bad at predicting the future. Um, so thinking through, you know, where one might go, the, the answer is, the real answer for me anyways, I don't know. So the capacity to go where necessary, I think is important. Um, it gets back into the set of mobility and logistics uh, set of issues. The final couple of points I would make are these. We don't want to go to war, but we want to be able to win if we could. And General Sanders underscored the value of not losing the first battle. I think that's right. I, I think that we want to therefore position ourselves uh, to be forward uh, as much as necessary. We need to sort out the relationship between knowing where we're going, and that was a point that was made uh, in the in an, in connection with NATO's new strategic concepts, so of knowing where we would fight, and yet not knowing where the fight would start. So we want to have both a understanding of the terrain 
an understanding of the host nation that we would support forward, an ability to engage uh, in the coalition, and an ability to, if necessary, do the unexpected. Uh, but I think that we have a real opportunity to enhance deterrence. Uh, we should be able to show the Russians that it would not be at all sensible for them to undertake an attack against NATO, against any of the NATO countries. But we're in a very difficult time, obviously, with respect to what's ongoing in Ukraine. The possibility of miscalculation is high, I would say. Not so, not at all certain, but, you know, high. I don't think we were able to predict Mr. Putin's movements. I don't think we really understand his thinking. At least I don't. Um, I can describe what's happened, but what will happen next, I, I don't know. Um, so I think we all want to do our best to make sure that our armed forces are capable of whatever task uh, they may be called upon, uh, that they can achieve it as promptly as possible. And I think we want to make sure that they have the right people and the right resources to do that. So let me stop there, Paul. Well, Frank, thank you very much indeed. Um, I agree with you. There's so much, so many technical possibilities uh, which seems to be whirling around. I was at a conference last week and there was that very distinct impression. There are so many things happening and it's quite difficult in a way to work out what's happening where and when and what will the implications be. But we spent quite a lot of time last week talking about artificial intelligence and specifically the effect it would have on the so-called OODA loop, observation, orientation, decision, action, as you know very well. Uh, and one interesting thought came out from that is that while AI and technology is compressing the O and the O and the D, it actually isn't doing that yet to the A, uh, to the action. And that's maybe where you know the human will remain indispensable in the loop. But can I ask you one final question uh, concerning deterrence, which I know is on your mind, has been, always has been, and certainly on my mind. And at City Forum, we're producing a short series of essays on deterrence. And it's this simple question. Would you say that the deterrence of Russia failed in Ukraine? Or would you say that it wasn't so much a matter of failure as a complete absence of deterrence? That's a very good question. I would say that the intent before the uh, February 24th invasion was to deter Russia through the anticipated use of sanctions, and that turned out not to be effective. I think that there was no significant military component of that approach. Of course, things have been going on, quite a lot of uh, training, uh, including by the UK, but it was not uh, the kind of military sets of relationships that we now see going on. There was no indication, for example, that we would provide uh, the kind of support that we provided. I actually wrote something in December of 2021 saying that there needed to be a military component without getting into the specifics. I, I didn't think that would it was had been sufficiently paid attention to. So I think in, from Mr. Putin's point of view, he thought that he would not get the degree of action by, if you will, NATO uh, that he's seen and that he would have a uh, much more easy time of it. And of course, I don't think that most people thought that the Ukraine military would do nearly as well as it did. I'm not sure that's a direct answer to your question, but I, I do think economic deterrence turns out to be insufficient. Yeah, I think that's a very good answer. Thanks very much. Indeed. Sadly, we're going to have to stop there. But Frank, thank you very much indeed for, for your response to General Sanders' earlier conversation. And I think actually what you've said uh, complements perfectly what what he said. I think they, they, these two perspectives work very well together. So thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, and on behalf of City Forum, very many thanks. My pleasure. Always glad to talk with you, Paul, and also for City Forum. Thank you.